All right, hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we are joined live by Pierre Fairgrew of New Street Research, who recently upped his price target on Tesla to $578 uh, post-split. So before we get started here, I'm just gonna have Pierre introduce himself, and then we're just gonna check the audio quick and make sure that we're not having issues like we did last time. Welcome, Pierre. Hey, Rob. Thanks a lot for having me, and uh, uh, I think I can uh already congratulate you for uh, making that uh, making that happen and staying calm and getting your uh, your stream uh, stream fit to work and uh, <laughs> I hope you, my voice is coming uh, across uh, good and you uh, you can hear me well and I'm, uh, I'm very glad to, to, to have some time with you uh, to catch up again great yeah I really appreciate you coming on I'm looking forward to it since our last uh, conversation a lot has happened since February all right, so I'm just watching the chats here. Uh, let me know, guys, if everything is going okay, and then we'll get started on the conversation. It looks like people are saying everything is great so far, so that's awesome. So sorry for that little bit of a delay. We had some technical issues, but <laughs> we got it figured out here, and uh, now, yeah, I think we'll just hop into it. So yeah, as I said, we last talked in February uh, up here, sort of mid-February, right when Tesla was really starting to take off after those uh, fourth quarter results. I think it spiked up to around $900 pre-split, and then, uh, yeah, it's been kind of a roller coaster since then, and obviously we're much higher than those levels now. So I think at that time you had had an $800 price target on the stock, which pre or post-split would be about $160. So now you're all the way up at $578. So with your new note, I just wanted to talk a little bit or have you talk a little bit about you know what has changed for you and for the company since we had last talked. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. And let me maybe uh, bother you with um, maybe taking a step back and looking at it from a broader perspective and tell you about uh, what it is to do to be, you know, a sell side analyst uh, uh, on a day uh, uh, on a day to day basis. So when we started working on Tesla with the team, it was uh, uh, very early 2018. Uh, and you have to remember what Tesla was at the time, like successful at doing the Model S, the Model X. Uh, getting kind of like unique economics to seem to work, but you know, difficult to really like stand out from the outside. Uh, and then the ramp of the Model 3 and, and looking at really what it meant to do an electric car, which was still relatively uh, difficult to, to figure out at that time. And we spent like months and months working, uh, working on that. And we came with this conclusion that uh, the near term would be a bit rocky, but that in five years from now, we were convinced Tesla, nobody would really come and hurt Tesla's trajectory in terms of competition. Uh, Tesla had a product that had demonstrated a very, very strong, um, uh, very, very strong interest in the market. So a lot of people uh, were interested in that market and the addressable market was big enough for us to make the call that over five years, Tesla could become, let's say the scale of BMW. Uh, and then we looked at the economic model, like where prices could set in terms of affordability, in terms of price competition. Uh, and then we looked at how the cost would evolve. And we had a second conclusion, which is it's going to be way more profitable than BMW. And that is this played out and was like the core of the controversy for 18 months. And we really like did a lot of work, extremely laser focused on this 2025 perspective. Can they be the scale of BMW? Can they make more money than BMW, et cetera? And we ended up actually getting even stronger in that conviction and saying like, like actually our initial margin target of 15% on that time horizon didn't make sense that they would probably be more like a 20% margin target. Uh, and so, so we, we were comfortable, uh, you know, seeing this initial investment thesis being maxed out. And our initial price target in April 18 was about $500, $530, if I recall correctly. We upped that to, I think, all the way to, you know, um, May, April or May last year to $900 uh, pre, pre-split. And then at that point, we felt the story is fully played out. I think like if our story comes across um, we think the stock is going to be worth something that is worth paying to the $900, but above that, we are not really comfortable. So we got like a more neutral perspective on the name. And then after that, we've had like three months during which we had to basically completely reset our cognitive framework. 
and to look at the company, company completely differently. And it's always a very difficult process uh, for a, a research team to do that because you have to forget about what you're focused on, like 2025. You have to forget about what you're focused on, like uh, the premium market, like competing with BMW, but not with Volkswagen. Uh, you, ha you have to remember that when you did this initial research work, you decided to pass on energy storage. Uh, you decided to pass on measuring the upside, like a successful, uh, a very successful, like autopilot uh, trajectory you could deliver, et cetera, et cetera. And so we started working again uh, on all these things we didn't really integrate in our initial view. Um, and then at the same time, we felt like we had to go through a very long list of checks, you know, on how the world had evolved over the last, uh, the last three years. And we looked again at competition. So we looked at um, le, le traditional manufacturers, of course, but we looked also at startups that were now much more tangible than they were three years ago. Um, and, uh, and as we were doing that, we didn't feel under any time pressure because in our initial framework, the stock was like almost nonsensical, way too expensive. So we, we didn't feel any time pressure to, to do that work. But once we finished that work, then we came back to valuation and we have like one mantra in our team, which is valuation is not our problem. That's the problem of the market. We're here to call things that we think are going to play out differently from what the market is expecting. But if the market decides to put a certain multiple on the stock, it's kind of silly to, to challenge that. The market is right on valuation. It's not us. Right? So we have to accept uh, uh, that sometimes the valuation framework on the stock change. And so that was the last piece we added to our new perspective, which is Tesla changed category in terms of valuation. It became like a hyper growth stock. And so that's something we had to, to get comfortable with. Uh, and, and, and we did, and, and I'll come back to that. Uh, and, and then we had like, we had a new perspective. And, and honestly, we didn't even call that like an upgrade. We call that like a reinitiation because the company we are looking at today is actually very different from the company we were looking at five years ago, I mean, three years ago. Um, so three years ago, we were looking at things on a five-year horizon. Now we are looking at them uh, actually on a 10-year horizon. Uh, five years ago, we were looking at a company whose bet, key bet was to take a place in the premium market, uh, in the premium car market. Now we are looking at a company that has a, a chance to become the largest car maker uh, in, a, in a decade from now. Uh, and then we looked at a, at a scale of disruption with uh, uh, like battery uh, battery technology uh, and the energy storage uh, 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 options that was actually larger than, than the car uh, the car industry. So the bottom line is that our 2025 2026 perspective didn't change much. We still expect Tesla to be around where we were expecting them to be a few years ago. But what has really changed is the kind of trajectory on which they're going to be. We think in 2025 it's not going to be the end of the story. It's actually going to be the beginning of the story. So in 2025, Tesla will be the scale of BMW, but it will be on its way to become the scale of Volkswagen. And that's really a major difference. So that means Tesla in 2025 should be trading between 50 and 100 times earning because it would still be a hyper growth name, a business whose like growth outlook over a decade is, is above 20%. Uh, and, uh, and we got comfortable on that front with like the work we did on competition and you know the time it would take uh, for competition across the whole value chain to to be able you know to uh, to get into the steps of uh, of tesla uh, and compete with them and we think competition is going to make progress but they're going to continue to like tesla uh, over uh, over a fairly fairly significant period of time i love all that stuff you're saying because i feel like a lot of times retail investors get frustrated with sort of the analyst community because a stock will take off and then there's just this whole new set of price targets that are you know close to what the stock is but what you're saying here there are just so many fundamental reasons for the change in your price target that it really makes it very understandable and especially the reinitiation portion of it and mm -hmm. assigning the higher multiple which is sort of a function of the market showing its willingness to give tesla that higher multiple so it is kind of like okay we've seen the market price tesla in this way so we can now sort of include that happening in the future with a higher multiple for what you're talking about there in 2025 because of the growth story being able to continue beyond that so i think that's a really good perspective that kind of helps probably retail investors understand what 
other analysts are probably doing as well when they sort of bring price targets a little bit along with a stock that has increased so dramatically in such a short period of time. Would you agree? Yes, exactly. And I think I think I understand the frustration of retail investors with analysts like increasing their price target. I mean, that often feels like a bit random. Uh, and I actually usually don't like doing that uh, uh, at all. Or when I do it, I take a lot of time to you know to get yeah. To get and that's what happened with Tesla, and and, and so, uh, um, but but that's that's really the way you know, uh, uh, the way uh, the way uh, the, the, the valuation is a very 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 subtle art. It's um, uh, there is an element you know of like group uh, group dynamics in it, um, and you know when when you think about a business you know growing earnings fifteen uh, percent a year, okay, for instance. If you grow your earnings 15% a year, it means in one year from now, uh, you're going to be uh, worth, you're going to be generating twice more earnings than today. Because when you grow 15% a year, you double every five years. Uh, so that's like, you know, one way to look at growth. Now, if you are a business growing earnings 15% a year to perpetuity, in a world in which the cost of money, risk-free money is maybe you could argue two percent, or maybe if you take like an equity premium, seven percent, but like way less than fifteen percent. Then what is your value? Your value is infinite. There is no you can't put a number. You're worth infinite. And so between fifteen percent a year is worth doubling my multiple, and fifteen percent a year is worth going to infinity. You have this range that is very broad, and that's a mathematical uh, reality. And as an analyst, you have to deal with that. And the good thing is that. It's not me who is going to say, Tesla is going to grow 15% a year over 15 years or over 21 years or over 17 years. I leave actually that to the market. And then I focus on what the market is expecting. And I think I add value to my clients when I tell them, you know, the market is expecting like that many cars next year, that kind of margin trajectory. And that's where I see things playing out differently on a relatively reasonable time horizon. And, and when that happens, it's a, uh, then, then you feel you can, add, uh, you can add value. So I think like to retail investors, I would tell them, you should be frustrated to uh, the what sales side and ace when they do that, but also you should be uh, you know, uh, uh, understanding and uh, uh, accepting that uh, this, this, when, when, when we are talking about growth, valuation becomes extremely volatile. It's very easy to justify something being worth two times, three times, four times what you were claiming uh, just before, if you just extend a bit uh, the gross horizon on the business. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit more about that because I think people may have a, a little bit of trouble understanding, like how could something be worth you know infinite value? But essentially what you're saying is that if you have that guarantee that it's going to happen in perpetuity, the, you know, the 15% earnings growth, which obviously that can't happen forever, but in a hypothetical situation where it did happen forever, then essentially all capital should just flow into that instead of getting a 2% return you know, somewhere else that's a safer investment. If you have this guarantee, then pretty much the capital should just flow there and that's what gets you that infinite value. Is that sort of what you're saying there? Yeah, it's a very, very good and very elegant way to uh, to understand it. And uh, congrats for that. It's very, very good. So yes, you, it's like, you know, uh, uh, you have water and you have uh, all, uh, uh, everything is communicating so the water can flow uh, through everywhere as long as you have a place where there is room for more water, it's going to suck in uh, water from uh, from everywhere else. And, and, and so if the world is at 2% and Tesla is at 15%, uh, capital will get in until uh, until it's, uh, it's dried out. Another way to look at it is to think at it as an operator. You don't have your own capital. You know you can borrow two percent here, and if you put it in Tesla, by the time you have to pay back in one year, you're going to make seventeen percent, like a fifteen percent from Tesla. You pay back your two percent, you're left with thirteen percent. And how much capital have you put in there? Well, actually zero. Okay, and so if two percent, uh, and then if you add like a risk premium, which is well, it's an equity, it's an equity business, so there is a bit of risk, and the cost of the risk to me is seven points then you have to pay back 2% for your cash and then seven points for your risk appetite, your, your ability to, to accept the risk of being invested in Tesla. And you're still left with, uh, uh, with eight 
eight percent that, that, that you can pocket in and so if, uh, if if you have that much money then you can reinvest it into buying even more tesla and and, and, and you see there is no end to the right. game right you know, or, or you don't have enough money left to uh, to pay for it right and just as a clarifying point neither of us is saying that tesla should be worth infinite value it's just a, a just a hypothetical type of scenario of why something could be if you had the guarantee <laughs> i'm pretty sure that's what you're thinking but you, you wouldn't dare to say it and i never say it <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit more about um, sort of those five years beyond 2025. And I do want to talk a little bit more about that time period too. But you were recently on, I think, Fox News or one of the Fox channels talking about Tesla. And you tried to make a little bet with the uh, with the host there that uh, Tesla would produce and sell more vehicles in 2030 than Volkswagen did. And they didn't take the bet. I wouldn't take that bet either. I would be on your side of that. But I'd love to hear just your perspective on why you think that's going to unfold that way. Yeah, so um, there are like uh, a couple of elements in that. So the first one is, uh, if you look at the car industry today, uh, they're start starting like putting out on the road electric cars uh, that are, you know, uh, getting a bit more uh, uh, reasonable in terms of specs and like range and performance, and uh, uh, and they're still very. Um, very expensive to manufacture because one of our key research findings that we think on average uh, a car manufacturer needs to spend an extra uh, $18,000 in order to be able to, to make a, one of their IC model electric. Uh, so there's still a lot of inefficiency in there. And it's, it's even, the point is even stronger when you look at the stark uh, contrast with uh, Tesla because like Model 3 is actually cheaper than equivalent uh, I see uh, uh, I see car. So, so we have this situation today, and today is also the time car manufacturers are introducing their like skateboard platform, uh, are scaling out you know battery supply in a way that resembles a lot what Tesla did with the Gigafactory five years ago, uh, what Tesla announced let's say uh, seven years ago, um, and so you have this idea that like the industry is getting. Uh, uh, its uh, efforts together in order to, uh, to, to follow suit on Tesla. Um, and exactly when they do that, Tesla actually is already, has already moved you know, to the next, uh, to the le next lane of, uh, of innovation, uh, both in terms of the car architecture and in terms of the battery architecture. So the car uh, is like the, the, the large cast model. So you have one uh, front, uh, front end, uh, rear end, and, and, and middle cast for the uh, for the car, the middle cast is actually the battery pack. You, you don't need a skateboard anymore. Uh, and I guess, you know, I'm not like a car manufacturing expert, but I I'd guess like efficiency improvement driven by that are probably going to be uh, as a percentage of the total cost, even more than, you know, uh, moving to a skateboard architecture from like a traditional IC uh, architecture. Uh, and of course, Tesla is introducing that today or like in six weeks or in maybe six months, yes, uh, maybe I'm a bit uh, uh, over-optimistic there, but let's say in the next year, it's going to be introduced. Uh, and other car manufacturers are nowhere on, the, uh, on that front. Um, so if they introduce their skateboard in 2021, they're going to use it for several years and they might look at introducing like another, uh, another car architecture uh, in five years from now. And so which means that in five years from now, uh, Tesla will have like a, a leadership that is similar to what you have today. Uh, and then on the on the battery front, I think what Tesla is doing um, uh, is going to be very, very challenging for, for car manufacturers to replicate. So the, they've really put, the, so you have like a couple of uh, uh, like really materials or deep like process innovation, like dry coating, um, uh, having silicone, uh, silicone uh, uh, the, 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 the anodes and uh, and uh, the, the also you know the architecture of the of, of the cell excluding like the, I forgot the name like the little bead on, uh, on top of it. The all tablets are fairly uh, are fairly uh, you know uh, uh, like uh, hardcore materials innovation, but at the end of the day, all these things don't make any sense if you don't speed up. Um, 
the, the pace of uh, process manufacturing. And if Tesla starts working on that today, over five years, I would be very, very surprised they don't deliver a very large chunk of the kind of uh, cost improvement and density improvement uh, they're anticipating today. Because it's a very, as Elon Musk characterized it, it's very simple to describe and to explain, very, very challenging to, to make happen. And so when you hear this guy telling you, yeah, so we've been working on this for two years and we are like a generation seven of our tooling, you're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the other guys are retooling every two years. And these guys are retooling every three months, every quarter. And so that pace of innovation, that reminds me also a comment uh, of Elon. Uh, he made uh, two years ago, a guy on the, on the conference call asked, uh, do you think you're uh, uh, your charging network is uh, is a barrier to entry, and Elon's answer was, "Barrier to entry is a lame concept. It's not the way I want to do business. I do business by innovating, and as long as you innovate better and faster than others, you win, and that's about it. And so we were not in that kind of setup yesterday in the battery domain. In the battery domain, Tesla had the biggest factory, the biggest." form factor volume, the biggest form factor uh, uh, volume times um, uh, like uh, uh, experience. So they had a lot of things, but they, they were actually biased to entries that could be eroded over time. And now in battery manufacturing, they are on a game of innovation. And I talked about accelerating the manufacturing of cells themselves, but all the work they are doing on, uh, uh, you know, redesigning uh, all like the vertical uh, integration of, uh, of the manufacturing of batteries, these are things where uh, very clearly, uh, other manufacturers are going to struggle a lot. And so here we are back to the innovation dilemma. And you look at what's like the traditional car manufacturer who I would respect the most in terms of you know, what they're doing in terms of electrification and things like that. It's actually um, uh, Volkswagen. Uh, they're the ones who announced that they would introduce a scale of board platform first. They, they are actually in the market with um, cars that are fairly affordable and doing quite well in Europe. Uh, so honestly, like the, the best best execution so far by far is Volkswagen. What is Volkswagen doing on the battery front? They're investing investing in quantum uh, uh, quantum scale, and they're trying to leapfrog uh, lithium ion battery with like the hope that uh, going solid state would actually uh, get them back in the game, and that's unfortunately a very very bad choice. You, you can read the math very, very simply. You look at solid state versus lithium ion. Oh, yes, it's better. But anyway, you know, solid state versus lithium ion, by the time it gets into the market and you're able to produce them in volume and you're able to do this and that, and with a lot of if, you apply the same kind of time constraint, uh, uh, time, uh, you offer as much time to lithium ion and as much ifs to lithium ion, and lithium ion will be actually better than, uh, uh, th uh, than solid state, or if they are not as good, they might be five or 10% behind, which means that solid state will never be like a breakthrough innovation that is uh, that is worth the, the cost. You know what? We've lived that already full cycle with form factors. Uh, I remember my colleagues at Bernstein explaining to me that cylindrical form factor was inefficient, it's mathematical, prismatic is better, touch is better, and you're like, yes, yes. But Manufacture them, like go through your experience curve, go through your scale curve, uh, and you'll see that by the time you have uh, uh, like uh, gotten to scale you, your better form factor, the less efficient form factor that has actually gone through that experience curve is still better. And you see today we're in 2020, and Tesla is announcing a totally new form factor. It's out of the blank sheet of paper, and guess what? It's cylindrical again. You know, so. That makes me feel very, very comfortable about what Tesla does between 2025 and 2023. They lead the way, they show the way. And then, so the big call is, if that's the case, then you have like a car platform that can hit like the $25,000 kind of uh, uh, cost bracket. So if you look at the total cost of ownership of a $25,000 electric car, I think it's equivalent to a 15, maybe $17,000 IC. So that means Tesla can address 80% uh, on even 90% of the market uh, with uh, with such a car, and, and and then of course like the margin profile might be 
a bit compressed by uh, affordability by the time we get there, but that means there is no reason Tesla should not be the scale of uh, Volkswagen by then. And remember that Volkswagen is like 13 or 14 percent of the market, which means that I'm not, I'm still expecting others to find ways to survive through that. It's going to be painful, but I, I don't even know that them disappearing. Do you think that there's going to be contraction just in like there are so many different auto brands out there in the world, and it's sort of a unique to the auto industry. Like I don't know that there are other major segments that have, you know probably 20, 25 significant brands in the marketplace. Like if you think of phones, maybe there's like three or four. I think mm -hmm. cars are always going to have a little bit more, but do you think we're going to see any just contraction in, in terms of offerings in the next decade? Um, no, nothing. I think the number one car maker in, uh, in 10 years from now is going to be larger than the number one car maker today. But that's because it's going to be Tesla and I would expect Tesla to, 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 to concentrate a bit. But Tesla might be 15% of the market. And if you want to be really bullish, you could say they're going to be 20% of the market or 25% of the market, but they're never going to be, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, like 50% of the market or even 40% of the market. And the reason for that is uh, simply that you, uh, this is an industry that is very, very physical, like the like products are very heavy and uh, they're very difficult to carry around. Like uh, I was looking this morning at market shares in, uh, in electric cars in, uh, uh, in Holland or in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Norway, where you see like, it's almost disappointing. You, you feel Tesla should be doing better in these countries. But, and then you remember they're manufacturing a car like in California and shipping them to these countries. And like they're competing with people manufacturing cars locally. And so that very local aspect uh, of, uh, of the market, uh, driven by like the, the physical form factor of the product, I think will remain. So that's one thing. And that's not the most important one. The most important one is that uh, the car industry, uh, uh, I mean, th that's a step on which governments are basically uh, uh, moving up uh, in order to impose uh, some rules to protect their, their local industry. So you. Uh, even under the most like liberal and uh, inefficient government in the U.S., you can't imagine the car industry in the U.S. going under for good uh, uh, on, on, on the turn of an innovation or on the turn of an economic crisis. And, and that's what we've seen actually in 2008, 2009. Le, le, these industries uh, are protected and uh, having a local player is going to be considered, uh, you know, a very... Uh, uh, a very important strategic uh, strategic asset. So, so, so we will continue to have fragmentation for that. And you know, the first industry I covered as a sales side analyst was actually telecom equipment. And when I started, um, you had as many telecom equipment manufacturers as you have car manufacturers today. And in, this industry went global because it was like serving networks. And once you know people started moving around, people realized like good networks are networks that interconnect with each other so the market became global very very rapidly and now we realize that uh, you have political forces going against that and like uh, the us is trying to rebuild their own value chain uh, and realize that having like networking equipment that have to rely on china is not a good thing and and, and probably uh, the regions in the world are, are going to, to to work a bit backward on that so the next 10 years are going to be favorable for like you know regionalization, a bit of protectionism, and things like that, and that is going to maintain the, the, the auto industry fairly fragmented. So let's talk a little bit about China then, because I think one of the bear cases that has been raised recently on China is that because of Tesla's you know full self driving software and the data that they collect, that China could potentially you know not be super into having Tesla doing that locally in China. Um, and maybe they would, you know, buy Tesla out or bar them from selling in the country. So I'd be curious to hear your take on that. And then I'd also be curious to hear just what your view on sort of the myriad of different upstarts, EV upstarts that we have uh, sort of forming right now in China or over the last few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so let me take the, the last one first. So um, you have interesting, uh, uh, interesting startups in uh, in china definitely and i think they are like more credible competitors right now than traditional automakers uh now when when you look at uh, 
uh, what they do, uh, you, you, you don't see like any, uh, uh, I would say, uh, you know, uh, clear demarcated edge over Tesla. So the good ones, I mean, they can claim performances uh, that are similar to Tesla at best. Uh, they can claim economics that are similar to Tesla. So when you look at the economics of uh, uh, NEO, like the most uh, uh, advanced uh, one in the, in the, in the development, uh, development scale, uh, they, I mean, they seem to have economics that are stacking up and adding up. And that means that they probably have like they are in a in a good place and, and they could be in a in a in a good place overall, uh, but they are not like in a place where Tesla is not. Um, and so Neo sells today, I think, like their, their base price is fifty five thousand dollars, being manufactured in uh, uh, in China. So they are kind of a bit ahead of where Tesla was in two thousand and twelve in terms of going down the cost curve. And then when you look at uh, what what could be claimed as a you know, differentiation or competitive advantage for Neo. They're talking about uh, their intelligence voice uh, voice activated system, or the fact that you can uh, swap a battery pack instead of um, instead of recharging it, or even better, the fact that you can rent the battery instead of buying it. Wow. So it goes from like financing to you know getting a battery pack in and out of a car Tesla tried it had one station doing it in California a few years ago. Uh, and I think over one year, only one guy showed up to, to swap its battery bag and they say, like, nobody wants it, so they stopped it. So there is no like fundamental, sustainable, defensible, competitive advantage in any of that, uh, obviously. And I, I haven't tried, you know, like the, the entertainment system of, uh, of Neo, but I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, there is not, nothing uh, you know, standing out in there that, that, that would um, create like a competitive threat to Tesla. So I think Tesla is in a very good place against all these um, these smaller players. And when you look at the US, so you have like, a, uh, you know, a Rivian is, um, uh, I think you, you, you can be positive on them the, in a very similar way. So they, they seem to be working through like the, the experience curve of being like a new car manufacturer and doing that relatively well, but they are years and years and years behind, um, behind Tesla. So they can be successful in the tail of Tesla. Can they challenge Tesla? Probably not. Uh, so that's uh, that's how I'm thinking about like new entrant, uh, new entrant competition. And then when, when you get China as a market, look, um, you know, I cover Intel, I cover Nvidia, I cover uh, uh, Apple, so many other names and players who are exposed to the Chinese market. And the Chinese market is a question mark for everybody today, uh, and, and it is a question mark for Tesla. And when you look at it, um, there are three parameters you have to take into account. Uh, the first one is, uh, you know, uh, the there is so much the Chinese government could do. If the, if the Chinese government wanted to, you know, take like uh, U.S. products out of their market, out of just protectionism or you know, just in a trade war kind of mentality they could have taken the iPhone out a long time ago, right? And if they don't do it, that's for a reason. Um, that's because they have a public opinion and, and, and even, you know, if they, if they don't have like very uh, straightforward elections as we do, the uh, uh, public opinion is important and you, you don't stay in power if you get a public opinion against you. So there is so much you can do on, a, on that front. And so if Tesla is extremely successful and is a, a car people want, um, uh, it's difficult for uh, for the Chinese government to decide to, to, to just push the, the manufacturer out. Uh, so, so, so Tesla will have to be successful with Chinese consumer. We have to be positioned as like a superior brand, etc. Uh, so that's that's one thing. Like, if you are commercially successful, it limits the room for maneuver for the government to go against uh, to go against you. Uh, and then there is an element of adapting your business model to operate in the country in which you are. Uh, so you, you have states uh, in, in the U.S. where you know you're not allowed to distribute your cars yourself, and Tesla has to deal with that. And so if, uh, if, if there has to be like a, a JV uh, for cars in China and things like that, it will be up to Tesla to decide uh, to decide what to do with it. At the end of the day, if you look at China in the global economy, it's probably a bit less than 20 percent for the car industry. It's probably more because we are still like in. Uh, 
equipment mode where a lot of people are buying their first car. So I don't have the exact numbers in mind, but it, it's probably between 25 and, uh, and 30 percent. And that's one part of the market where there is like a significant political risk as, uh, uh, as there is uh, anywhere else. Uh, what you know for sure is that the scenario where uh, Tesla is simply blocked out of China uh, is probably not, uh, is very, very unlikely in a scenario in which, uh, you know, uh, Tesla suffers more from local competition in China than elsewhere uh, is likely. But remember, this is anyway a general trend in today's world that you'll have more protectionism. And, you know, I don't know what the French government or the German government or others will do to, to, to favor their lo local players, but they, they will do things and things that sometimes are very difficult to quantify and see. Uh, and, and Tesla will have to fight in, uh, in this market. So one thing is certain, like the Model 3 in the US uh, has more than 50% market share in the mid-size sedan segment, okay? Um, I'm not telling you Tesla is going to get 50% market share globally. I think Tesla is going to have between 15 and maybe 20% market share globally uh, eventually, and they will have a much, much stronger market share in the US and a lower market share in other markets in, uh, in the world. We have to see how each market plays out. And I don't think China is on like a particular you know, it's a particular red flag specific to Tesla. I think China is uncertain today for everybody and for Tesla as much as others. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, we're coming up on the end of the hour here. I want to be respectful of your time. Do you have time for a couple more questions or do you yeah. have to hop off? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. again? Yeah, I'm good. You're good? Okay, awesome. Um, so one of the things I always want to talk to with analysts such as yourself is just sort of try to get a better understanding of the institutional investor sentiment or sort of what type of questions that you guys are receiving from them. Um, so I'd be curious to hear that, especially coming out of Battery Day, sort of the reaction. Yeah. Um, so it's very interesting to see uh, institutional investors being much more appeased today than they were two years ago. So. And that's kind of weird because two years ago, my claim was very, very like down to earth. But it's just they just do great cars, and nobody can do cars as good as theirs. And demand for these cars is strong, so they're going to be a great, very successful car manufacturer. It's like very, very straightforward. And people were like, "But you can't realize they are already worth more than all other car manufacturers together." It's like doesn't make any sense. So people were really. You know, tense. Like so, you had the believers as well as you know, uh, as you all know, a minority amongst uh, institutional investors, and there were the non-believers. And the non-believers had a very clear tendency to find outrageous the idea of, uh, you know, uh, uh, having a positive view on Tesla. Uh, today, you still have believers and non-believers, and believers are like. Uh, getting com comfortable with valuation level thinking, but yes, at the end of the day, uh, uh, Amazon uh, Amazon got where they are by dominating a very, very significant shift in the market, which was like dematerialized uh, retail. And if Tesla becomes a similar global player for like clean energy and transition to, to clean energy, well, uh, uh, why not uh, having these very high multiples? And so, so, so and they are actually doing work on the name in a, in a much more constructive way. Uh, and they are much, uh, uh, conversations are much easier. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that's very interesting. And I think, uh, you know, like the debate around Amazon evolved in a similar way in the late, in the late 2000s. So, so we see a very similar, uh, similar pattern on Tesla. So I think in, uh, my bet is that in six months from now, Valuation multiple won't be a debate about Tesla, like the idea of comparing them to another car manufacturer and things like that, won't be a debate. And then uh, uh, institutional investors will start focus on, uh, uh, on on things on which you guys are focused uh, day in, day out, you know, looking at uh, how things are progressing, how cars are doing in different markets, uh, uh, taking a closer look at, uh, you know, the evolution of the competitive landscape from a, from a technological perspective. And I think, uh, the, uh, if you take the example of batteries, like the debate, like solid state versus lithium ion, 
is going to be a very a much more enjoyable debate because people will really look at it and look at the analysis and think about like okay do, do i bet on uh, the, the, the time advantage of, of lithium iron or like the breakthrough potential of a, uh, of solid state and people are going to look at these things and reconsider the pros and the cons of uh, of any uh, of any of any conversation and, and this is this was not the case uh, two years ago so, so it's evolving it's evolving in a positive way it's probably going to make the stock less uh, uh, less, vol less, uh, less volatile uh, going forward okay that makes sense um i just want to check my list here and make sure i'm getting everything So one of the things we talked about last time was just autonomous driving. So I know you're not a huge bull in that regard. So I'd be curious to hear how that factors into your price target and just if you have any updated thoughts since we sort of last talked about um, Tesla's autonomy features. Yeah. So I think in, uh, in autonomous driving, you have um, two, two things. You have like a very clear distinction between driverless services so you have a car without an employee in it without an operator in it that can deliver a service uh, commercial or not uh, and then you have cars that are very autonomous which means that they drive by themselves most of the time but you know you're still sitting in there and uh, and, uh, and uh, able to intervene uh, one uh, one way or another and so my my overall perspective on, uh, on that uh, part of technology infrastructure is that the key challenge here is not as much technology as routes to market for driverless services. The real challenge of Waymo today is not to be the best driverless technology because they are probably the best driverless technology. The biggest challenge, the, the biggest challenge they have is to be able to get out of 50 square uh, miles in Phoenix and uh, a thousand uh, like a pre pre selected under NDA uh, uh, user. So it's still very, very far from commercial. And they've announced last week that they, they, they're going to open the service to, to, to the greater public, but still on a very narrow area. And they, they still admit that in order to expand this area within Phoenix, they'll have to get drivers or operators back into cars. And so that's, that's a key challenge. And that's because of that key challenge that I'm saying Tesla is not going to become like ride hailing uh, operation just because they have the best autonomous driving technology because uh, there is a gap between the two which is an execution gap which is a route to market gap a deployment gap like it's a technology that is very complex to deploy if you hear you know the most uh, like early innovators like uh, guys who have really set like the technological scene for uh, autonomous driving uh, they, they, tell, they tell you today uh, the technology is still making great progress but we still have like these deployments. Uh, we still don't know how to, to deploy the technology. And so as an aside, my view here is that the key asset to deploy that technology is an existing ride hailing network. If you have 30,000 uh, drivers around, uh, around the city, uh, it's very easy to, for you to introduce a thousand car and make the service uh, like make sense uh, from an economic perspective. Uh, if you start the service from scratch, you have to compete against the 30,000 drivers. And initially, your autonomous, like driverless advantage is going to be a very narrow portion of your fleet because only a very small number of rides will be eligible for a car without an operator, without a driver. Uh, and that percentage is only going to increase very slowly over several years and on a market by market basis. Okay, so how do you deploy a service in this condition if you're Tesla or if you're Waymo, by the way? So the only guys who I think are credible at deploying that are uh, a Lyft or an Uber or a TD or a Grab, and that's the reason why uh, we, we cover with the team of sources and uh, these names. We think they are very, very important assets for the success of autonomous driving. So when you bring that overall perspective to Tesla, what does that mean? That means something very contrasted because on one side, they are the guys with the most cars on the road, so they are the ones who can learn the fastest, so that's definitely a massive advantage. But they don't have like a ride hailing operation on which they can roll out the service. So I think they're going to be very successful at making, making car autonomous, but they're not going to make money 
out of delivering driverless services. And so in my perspective, that means maybe one day Tesla makes five, six thousand dollars more per car because they sell with each car an, an autonomous driver that people enjoy using for their personal self use and you know to read the newspaper when they are on their car or even even maybe have their car go and pick up their kids uh, from school or from activities and come back or something like that. And that's going to, and, and that means, you know, doubling, uh, almost doubling, you know, potentially the profit you can make on your, on, on your car business. So that's very significant, but that's not going to be like the Tesla robot taxi view. Okay. Yeah. And I think when we last had this conversation, your thoughts were very similar. Um, and I think I, I want to have the conversation again once, uh, Elon's much hyped uh, full self-driving rewrite comes out because I think, you know, we'll, we'll just have to see how how advanced it is at that point in time. I think that's how you completed last time as well, and, and it was one year ago. And you see, in one year, the technology has made progress, but like the kind of route to market to uh, driverless services has not really made progress. So we should have mm -hmm. a conversation in one year with great pleasure. Well, thank yes, you. absolutely. Yeah. Do you have time to take a couple questions, maybe from yeah. the live stream? Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Uh, feel free to look through, and it'll take a little bit for the delay to catch up, but uh, we'll both be looking here for some questions. I let you pick the question and then uh, ask them to me, Rob, okay? Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Make sure the live stream is still... Comments are still coming through here. Um... While we wait for the questions, maybe just a really quick one for you. Yeah. Is Tesla the stock you're most excited about in your coverage, or is there another one? Um, that's definitely the most exciting name. And, and when when I'm talking about excitement, it's excitement about the job of doing research on the on the name. Uh, the, I, I unfortunately cannot give you comments about investment recommendation like on a, <laughs> in public like that. I, I, my job is regulated for that, unfortunately. So the most exciting name to cover is definitely Tesla. Uh, and I have a couple of other names I find very, very exciting, particularly exciting. Uh, it's uh, SoftBank, because SoftBank owns a vision fund. And in the vision fund, you have like uh, almost 100 investments in companies that have like you know, uh, a scope of potential outcome and opportunities that are absolutely amazing. Um, uh, and then another one that is very exciting uh, by its unicity is um, uh, Uber, for the reason I just mentioned. I think Uber is for now uh, not well understood, like the fact that they, they, have, they, they have a platform, they are like a software company. What they really offer is a software platform on which uh, drivers and uh, people needing a ride can get together and uh, uh, optimize the economics of finding a way to do business together. Uh, and that not only that business is absolutely beautiful with very, very strong uh, competitive dynamics driving to uh, duopolies, uh, so uh, ensuring very, very good returns. But on top of that, owning that asset, that matching, you know, that marketplace where drivers and riders can meet uh, is, is the key to the one thing that will probably change the most the way we live in the next 20 years, which is that we'll have autonomous cars everywhere. And I don't think it happens without Uber. So that's a very, very unique, very exciting situation. And then what I would say is that I cover after that, like all the technology value chains, so like chip manufacturers, uh, manufacturers of semi-cap uh, equipment, so manufacturing the tools you need to manufacture chips. And, the thing is that what's happening at Tesla, what's happening at the Vision Fund, what's happening at Uber has like very, very interesting implication in the whole chain. Like looking at, uh, at that overall is probably uh, at the end of the day the most exciting part of the, of the story. Yeah, I think that's I think that those follow on effects are really interesting because I think it's a lot more difficult to sort of understand and piece together all of that stuff because it's not like consumer focused level where everyone sort of sees it as visibly. So I think that's interesting. All right, let's take a look here for some questions. Um, oh, there is one I'm going to take. What's your take about standards and poor inclusion? So that's typically the kind of stuff on which you, you bear. 
you don't want to ask me. I'm terrible at that. You know, I'm good at like uh, opening uh, the hood of a Tesla and looking at like components uh, uh, that have made it through and, uh, you know, what, what makes a car uh, unique and things like that. But market moving things like inclusion in the, in the S&P and things like that. I've always been voiceless on these things. I don't, uh, I don't really understand how it works. So I'm sorry. <laughs> that's a question I can't really take. No, that's interesting though, because I think you know, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, people were sort of obsessed with that question. Um, was it, from your perspective, institutionals, do they care about that stuff, or have they been asking you about it? For them, it's like uh, they can play on these things. So they have very sophisticated ways to to play that kind of events, but that's totally out of my realm, of my scope. I can tell you they don't call me to ask me my opinion on that one. <laughs> they call it, they call it. So they're interested, but not not from you. <laughs> All right, let's see. Oh, so one thing we didn't really talk much about was the energy business. You had mentioned it a little bit and just the addressable market. So any quick comments on that? Yeah, I think uh, when, when we started looking at Tesla in 2018, uh, I really was like, I gave, basically gave a pass on that one. I was like, I have no idea, you know, for the moment it's crap and I have no idea how big it could be. And so, and we did a lot of work to try and figure out, uh, you know, uh, how big the market could be and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and also make sense of like the 10 terawatt hour number uh, Tesla pulled out on the, on the battery day. Uh, and this all, uh, boiled down to the following. So it's a pure commodity business. So um, demand for energy storage is going to be driven purely by the cost. Like the less expensive, the more it makes sense to have batteries around. Okay, and it, it's just a cost trade-off. That's one thing. Then the second thing that today, if you can, you can do systems that are like in the low one hundred dollars per kilowatt hour that can be up and running in. Um, uh, you know, like a large scale for industrial sites or for like the grid or a smaller scale for re re residential. Uh, and, and, and the market is there and demand is sustainable and growing very fast. And actually, from all accounts, we hear that demand is largely outstripping supply. So if, if that segment of the industry could have twice more batteries, it would be putting out twice more batteries. So at $120, let's say $110, uh, the technology makes sense. And what Tesla explained on the battery day is that these systems are probably going to cost $50 per, um, uh, per kilowatt, kilowatt hour in, uh, in five to 10 years from now, and it's going to take off anyway. And, and then we, we thought it was still too early to be too specific about how to dimension and size like the trajectory of the market, but we, we, I asked one of my uh, guys in the team to calculate how much energy we were consuming every year overall, all included. And he came down with that number, 110,000 terawatt hours a year. Worldwide? Worldwide. And then if you have that, and you say, OK, if all that shifts to our, um, renewable energy, the majority of it would have to be solar. So let's say it's all solar to make it simple. Even if it's a bad, it's not going to be the case at all. But to make it simpler, then and you assume it's very local solar. So what you need is basically one day of uh, one day of capacity uh, of storage capacity for the system to work. And you could argue it's a bit more, a bit less, or it could be twice less. But to keep things simple and really aim for an order of magnitude, so one day would be 300 uh, terawatt hour of capacity installed. And then you're like, okay, fine. And then, but that's installed capacity. So maybe that's something you refresh every 20 years. And actually, let's say that's something you're going to ramp over 20 years, between 2030 and 2050. Then every year, you would need about 5% of that. And 5% of 300 uh, uh, terawatt hours is 15 terawatt hours. And then we're like, this is as simple as that. That's very simple, and as anyone can get it. My, I could explain that to my mom. She would be like, yeah, OK, that makes sense. And it's very, very simple. It tells you that's the kind of scale uh, you should expect for that market on the 2030 horizon. It's not 2050. It's actually 2030, when it runs, not when we are done. So in 2020, even if we have 10% of our energy consumption that is going through batteries, the market, the annual market could be 10 terawatt hours easily. 
of even 15, it could be. And that, that, that's $750 billion a year. And so in some things, the battery market is going to be relatively local, very similar to, uh, to, some, uh, the, to the car industry. And I don't expect Tesla to take like 80% of that, but if they take 25% of that, uh, uh, you know, that's $200 billion of additional revenue. Which is significant. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe final question here. I'll put you on the spot. Do you ever think Tesla will be the biggest company or the most valuable company in the world? Um, uh, so of, of the companies I know, yeah. Difficult to say. Um, I mean, like Alibaba and Amazon still have like a massive uh, leeway in terms of growing their business. So, you know, when, when Tesla is like two, three trillion dollars, uh, Amazon and Alibaba could be actually uh, larger. But but I think Tesla will be larger than Apple, larger than Google, larger than Facebook. Uh, larger than uh, larger than Microsoft, without any doubt. But like for, for like the retail guys, who knows? And then you have to wonder whether, over the next ten years, there would be another area of disruption with the market, the size of the car market that could be disrupted. And here, the only one I can see that could be sizable enough to offer such a disruption would be like actually the like the real estate market. And so, like you know, building, renting, using like using space, like new business models, like we work and things like that. It's an area where things could emerge and end up be be uh, bigger than an Amazon and bigger than a Tesla. But today, it's like uh, they are fairly fairly early in the, in the development stage. So on a ten-year horizon, it's probably not going to be enough for. Uh, a play in that space to get uh, to get as big as Tesla. So Tesla is like energy plus transportation. It's a damn lot. All right. Thanks, Pierre. Always a pleasure to talk to you. I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Rob. Always a All pleasure. Right. Time. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to listen. All right. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye.